Niepoprawne Radio.pl Witam wszystkich słuchaczy w kraju i na świecie. Dziś mamy zaszczyt gościć w naszym radiu panią Kathy Synod. Hello Kathy. Hello Tom. How are you today? Great. Very good. Nice to hear that. Kathy była członkiem Parlamentu Europejskiego w latach 2004-2009 z ramienia ugrupowania Niepodległość i Demokracja. Reprezentowała tam Irlandię. Obecnie Kat jest jedną z głównych postaci w stowarzyszeniu przeciwko w stowarzyszeniu rodzin przeciwko państwu. Dziś porozmawiamy z panią Synod na temat referendum, jakie miało miejsce 10 listopada 2010. Referendum, które dotyczyło zmian w konstytucji odnośnie rodziny. Right, Kathy. I just told our listeners about the fact that here in Ireland you had this referendum concerning the changes of attitude of the state attitude toward the family. Could you tell us why actually Ireland changed this? Well, Ireland didn't, the people of Ireland didn't change it on purpose. They voted not knowing what they were doing. Um, the actual referendum, the actual changes to the Constitution deleted a very important section of the Constitution that protected children and where a parent was failing, it protected the child. If the failure was abuse or neglect, it obliged the state to step in and protect that child and give the child the help the child needed. But it also distinguished between failure that we can all face for things that aren't our fault. We could get sick, we could die, the ultimate failure to a child we could have a disability or our child could have a disability and have more needs than we can meet. Um, we could be poor. And that obliged the state to help the parent and to help the child, but to do it in a respectful way that preserved the parent and the child's relationship. And so in other parts of the Constitution, the family is seen as superior to the state. In other words, the state is there to protect the family, to support the family, so that the family can do its work of protecting the human person, and in particular, children, elderly, you know, vulnerable people. Now, this amendment, the new words they put in, gave the state control of children, all children. It gave the state less responsibility for to actually help children, no responsibility to help their parents, help them. And it also created a situation where when the state is neglectful, which the Irish state has a very bad record of being, we can't get them in court. That what's best for children doesn't apply in court cases against the state. So the state had everything to win and parents had everything to lose. But parents weren't told that. They weren't told that this vote gave up their right to be the parent, to do what God gave them to do, which is nurture the child and protect them. They were told that they, people were told, voters were told, that they had to vote yes to help abused children which was the furthest thing from the truth. Because the Constitution as it was already obliged the state to help abuse children and they weren't doing it. So changing the words gave the state less responsibility, more control, and got them out of trouble for their neglect. That's really amazing because, I mean, when I was doing the research for this interview, I found uh, like expressions, like for example the Sinn Féin, you know, spokesman, Sinn Féin, which is opposition, right? He said something like, this referendum, this new wording, was a significant step towards enshrining children's rights in the, in the, in the Constitution. How would you comment on that? What, what made, uh, made them to say so? Like? Okay, well, two, I suppose that there are three things here. One is Sinn Féin, although there are many good people in it, many pro-life people. Sinn Féin is, when you look on the website, when you look at it, 
They're a Marxist group. In the European Parliament, they sit with the Marxists. They're in the Marxist grouping, which is called the GUI. Um, they are a pro-abortion political party. If you look at their website, they are committed to bringing in abortion, even though many of their own members don't realize this. Why else would they say it? Um, another reason they would say it is that this is what they were told. You know, the government information was that this was about children's rights. And in a sense, they were, it was true. Because we're talking about two different sets of rights. Children have rights in the Irish Constitution. They have the same rights as I have, you have, under Article 40. They have the right to, to the protection of their family. They are members of families. They're as much a member of a family as parents. So they have the superior and antecedent rights, as it's called in the Constitution, of the family. And then thirdly, in Article 42, they have a right to education because that's the main work of childhood, is learning and developing. And they have that right according to their need not dependent on resources. And they also, in Article 40, have the right to the protection if their, if their parents fail. So children had all the right to be fed, to be nourished, to be nurtured, to learn, etc. But we're talking about a new set of rights in this amendment. So although the proponents of the yes side in saying this is about children's rights, were telling the truth, they weren't expecting, they weren't explaining to parents what those rights were and how they differed from the rights that parents would think of. So you're so, saying that there are going to be a new set of rights. A new you say set something rights. about this? Yes, rights, and the thing actually. is that a, a Marxist group like Sinn Féin, and as I say, I exclude many Sinn Féin members who haven't got an, an, any idea of this, who are in good faith they are signed up to this new set of rights. And what are those rights? Well, to find them, you look in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and they're spelled out. Uh, a child has a right to privacy. Child have rights to privacy. Remember, people. And this specifically what, says... What's, what about the age? What kind of age can be? It specifically says that this right is even from their parents. Wow. And age doesn't come into that. Now, a child has a right to access all forms of communication, a right to access. So all people, communication, and when you look in the UN Convention, and I would recommend people read this document and read it twice, because the first time you'll be lulled by the language you know, the caring language. Yeah, jargon. The second time, read it to say, yeah, but who decides this? Who controls this? Who does this refer to? And then you will suddenly see that they're giving children rights to full access to every form of communication, and every form of communication rights to reach the child. Right to privacy, unrestricted right to privacy from their parents and everyone else. Except the state. Yeah. So uh, there are going to be new rights for the kids, for the children, right? Yes. And to find out what those rights are, people need to look at the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, Ireland ratified this in 1992. So 20 years before this. And the rights in there are very specific. And I would advise anyone to read that convention because Poland is signed up to it as well. Um, now, those rights, and read, the, and read the document twice. It's an international treaty and it's binding. And the rights in it, you know, when you read the document the first time, you'll get caught in the language, the lovely kind of caring language. When you read it the second time, Ask yourself, yes, but who decides this? Who controls this? Who represents the child? Where are the parents? And then you're suddenly going to realize that this is a treaty about state control, actually UN control 
of all child policy and state control of children, and a complete ending of parental rights and the rights of the family. Now, the specific rights for children, um, of course, like in all of our constitutions, children must be fed, nurtured, their you know, life protected, etc. And this, this lulls people. Because, but we already have this in our own constitutions. You know. But the other rights are things like the right to privacy. And it's an absolute right. And it specifically says that it includes privacy from their parents. And remember, children go from, in this convention, children go from birth to 18. Now, in the preamble of this convention, this treaty, children before birth are mentioned. But that isn't legally binding. It's just children from birth that are being given rights. Then the right to um, access communication, the right to access. So this gives a child to the right to access all forms of communication. And, and it lists, you know, it, it makes a big list so that you have, are under no doubt that they're entitled to go anywhere on the internet, you know, read anything, you know, get any information, regardless of parenting, regardless of their parents, or what's good for them. Then they also have a right to assembly. And this right to assembly um, is the right to access any people, join any group, etc. And this is the only right that has a small restriction. But it's the state that can set the restriction based on public order and um, public order or safety. And this is very interesting because when you're looking at this treaty, you're really realizing that this gives the right to the state to form citizens, to mold people, you know, cookie cutter children. Therefore, once they've molded them, they also want to ensure that it doesn't go back on them. So, of course, they can restrict the right to assembly if they decide, you know, that they don't want them marching or don't want them whatever. And a right to conscience, thought, etc. And it's in this right that the child has a right to think any thoughts, to have their own ethos, their own religion, their own anything. But it's very interesting the way it's written because the state decides, you know, it says that the parents have a role in passing on their ethos and religion, etc. But again, the state decides that. The state, you know, by guaranteeing it, regulates that. Um, so it really mustn't be confused with say, um, you know, the freedom of religion um, in, say, the American Constitution of 250 years ago, uh, where, you know, it was the freedom to practice their religion, to pass it on. This wording lends itself much more to the freedom from religion. You know, not to have religion imposed on you by your parents. Not to be taught something that... Um, maybe the state disagrees with. So, um, other rights, it's interesting, there's a section for children with special needs. And the only right in the whole treaty that is given to children, the only right that is modified by resources, in other words, money, is the right for children with special needs to get the help that they need, maybe a wheelchair, maybe a ramp, maybe special tutoring etc. Well, that's subject to resources and the state decides what it can afford to spend. And what, what these rights demonstrate is that a good parent, you know, we have the rights we're thinking of to be fed, to be loved, but they're giving children, they're locking into our constitution a new set of rights, which in many cases are very bad parenting, you know. I mean, how do you protect a child from cyberbullying if they have full access to the computer, and if you've no right to know what they're doing or who they're talking to. You know, if, if picking up their phone, you know, if you see your child very distressed, you know, day after day, 
if you have no right to pick up their phone and see what, what's being said to them, you know, yeah. things like that. Like, how do you protect your children? So it's guaranteed with these new rights that parents and state are going to clash because parents love their children and the state doesn't. And they're going to clash because the state, not the parent, is in charge of ensuring these rights, fighting the child's corner for these rights against the parent. But state is an abstract, abstract, right? I mean, what there are they really? They're people, as you and me and every one of us. But do they see this? Can they see, actually, can't they see what they, um, this, what you told us about right now? Well, I, I mean, they, they do see it. They do see it because when we say the state, the face of the state officials. can be a social worker yeah. working for the health authority. Mm -hmm. It can be a judge sitting on the bench. It can be a guardie coming to your home and confiscating your child, you know, because he's got an order to do that. It can be... Um, you know, a nurse, a teacher, whoever the state designates, whoever the face of the state is. So, do they see it? Well, they do in Ireland because this convention, as I say, was ratified 20 years ago. And in our family courts, which are secret courts, and I can explain that in a minute, yeah. this convention has already been implemented for, well, well over a decade now. And just to explain when I say secret courts, any case that involves a child in Ireland, except a criminal case, but any civil case involving a child is what's called in camera. In other words, on the courtroom there will be a sign put up saying in camera, which means no one can go in. There's no, for instance, a judgment will be handed or an order will be made by a judge, but there's no judgment that explains how he came to that decision. No justification of the judgment. Yeah, there's no scrutiny. There's mm -hmm. no press. No one can know what happened. And, you know, I didn't know really anything about these. You know, I knew they existed, but I didn't know they were a problem until I became an MEP. And then constituents of mine started to come to me and tell me what was going on, tell me their story, seeking help for me. And I wound up going into these courts and just being completely shocked, watching loving parents having, you know, not able to get their children back who had been confiscated. In, in one case where I went into the courts, this mother had been, you know, her baby was seven months old, seven weeks old. She was breastfeeding. Everything was going great. And the health authorities took the child. Why? What? Well, in her case, she had been what she called a wild child many years before. Mm -hmm. And so she did have children in care. She, she had, uh, was in a very abusive relationship and she sought help from the health authorities. And of course, instead of helping her, they took her children. So she had spent the last four years doing everything to get her children back, parenting courses. She, you know, gave up smoking. She gave up drinking completely. She, you know, did everything they said. She kept her house meticulously tidy, etc. Never missed an appointment to see her children and constantly worked to get more and more time with them. And when she was expected, then she got married to a, a, a nice man, a Ukrainian man, an engineer. Um, they were expecting their first child. In the maternity hospital, the social worker said, you know we're going to take this child. Although she had stable life and... Although, and she was now married, the problem was gone. The problem she had sought help for, which she never got help for, was gone. Oh. So she ran away. She went to a pro-life group who helped mothers in crisis. And the, these beautiful women took care of her at the other side of Ireland and they, she had her baby, she was very happy uh, and that health authority found out where she was when the baby was seven, months, seven weeks old and came and took the child. Now she fought, she was fighting to get her child back. She had done nothing wrong, she had done no criminal activity, her mothering was wonderful 
and the day I was in court, they said um, she has a flat aspect. Excuse me? A flat aspect. What's I that? had never heard that before. But you know when you're called before the headmaster at school, and he's yelling at you. Well. And you go, and you're very careful about what you say, you're very careful about what you do. Every time she saw her children, there were social workers there. And she was very careful. But, so the judge was told she had a flat aspect and that was bad for her baby. And so he said, oh, okay, well, the baby has to stay at foster care. Foster care. Yes. And so this is what, so the state knew because they're already doing it mm -hmm. in the family courts. But the people don't know because they're secret. Unless they've been involved in some way or it's touched their family. And there were a significant number of people who it has touched. So they knew exactly what they were doing. But this costs a lot of money, confiscating kids. All these, you know, foster care costs money, etc. So the new system in this amendment was that they could forcibly adopt. In other words, they could take the kids, but they could give them to someone else and there'd be no money to pay. That's cheaper. Much cheaper because adoptive parents will pay legal fees. They will, you know, it's a win-win for the state. And um, so everything was about saving money and gaining control. But people didn't know that. Well, that's amazing. All right, so you told us about the nature of the changes. So if you don't know what's going on, usually it's you know the matter. If you don't know what, if you don't know what matters, usually money and power matters. So quite simple. Could you tell us something about the context? You know about the context of this referendum. I actually I'm aware that you you know whenever you go on the street, you can see. Uh, only yes, 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 yes posters. Yeah. There, there must have been huge money spent for those posters, actually. That's right. Well, first of all, the context is that for the last 20 years, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, which was set up by the treaty to monitor Polish child policy, Irish child policy, child policy all over the world, um, they've been demanding a referendum. So world they've been demanding right? the world government. Mm -hmm. They've been demanding that our constitution be made compatible to the UN Convention, not the other way around. Right. And they've been demanding that. Now, some countries ratified with reservations to accommodate their constitutions. So there wasn't a conflict. They just didn't sign up to anything that country. Ireland didn't do that. They just embraced it completely and obviously decided we'll change it when we can. Now, in 2005, there's an interesting exchange between our Minister for Children and the UN Committee. All these documents are in the UN. You can get them online, but people don't know that. But there's an interesting exchange where they're demanding that, the refer you know, that we change our constitution, and it's been so long, and when are you going to do it? And he says, look, the Irish people are very attached to their constitution. So we've got to be careful. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I'm not giving mm -hmm. an exact quotation. But, you know, basically, we've got to be careful. We've got to get the conditions right. We have to get the words right. You know, it, it's not easy to pull the wool over Irish people's eyes, particularly in this area. So, obviously, they considered that now conditions were right. We had the abuse scandals you know, the clerical abuse scandals. And what's very interesting is they held back the other abuse scandals. You know, there's, there's abuse in, in, you know, there, in fact, there's a group lobbying very hard for the last five years that the state would bring out the abuse that happened in non-Catholic, in say Protestant things, and in state abuse. State, mm -hmm. And uh, abuse in the sports organizations, abuse in schools, you know, owned by the state, run by the state. So, so the state failed as well. I mean, oh, well, the well, even in even in the clerical abuse, it was very clear that the state handed the children over, walked away, underfunded, didn't monitor, and we already had a high court judgment, my own son's judgment. 
that says that when children have been damaged, that the primary culprit is the state who hands them over and never looks back. That the state must monitor vulnerable children. And now the state has go is going to have more power than before. That's right. Though and it, it actually failed. And in fact, during the time of the abuse scandals, the state was fighting a woman here from Cork in Kinsale who had been abused repeatedly by a teacher in a public school. And they fought her through to the Supreme Court that they were not responsible, even though they trained the teacher, they paid the teacher, they pensioned the teacher, they inspected the teacher. You know, everything was to do with the state. What about Edna Kenny? Shouldn't he actually interfere in this? Because like he was so eager to say something nasty to, towards Pope and stuff. What about himself? No, no. He is Long totally... Trip? No, Enda Kenny is totally on board for this whole agenda. Mm -hmm. Enda Kenny is a European. Mm. And Europe would like us all to come under this. I mean, Europe has also, in the Lisbon Treaty, put the, the UN Convention in the Lisbon Treaty. They put children's rights there. So they want this in every country. They want control. Every Europe. country. Yeah. So we EU can expect control this in Poland of child everywhere. policy. You know, UN control via the EU into... Yes, you can expect it in Poland. Absolutely. You know, it would be important to check what reservations your government made when ratifying this. Mm -hmm. But when you see, you will know what's expected of you. But the EU would like full control in that, you know, with the EU. UN. actually. Yes. And so the thing is that Andy Kenny's just a European. He, he has long ago given up being attached to the Irish people. You know, he's, he's, his umbilical cord is firmly attached elsewhere. In Brussels. Brussels and New York, Geneva, you know, anything bigger than Ireland. So, um, anyways, that's, you know, what we're facing into here is this just control of children. And it's sad because it misses the very point about children. And that's that in nature there is a mechanism for protecting children. And we all know what that is, but to put a name on it, it's attachment it's the bond and you know a mother or a father they would die for their children and and they do every day they give everything for yeah. their children they go yeah. to work for their children they you know think about their children and they know their children and it's that bond with the family grandparents brothers and sisters you know it's that family bond which protects children and there's many times in history, you know in your own Polish history, the communist state, uh, you know, we saw it in Hitler. The same thing, they all realized. Voltaire, Voltaire and the, with the Enlightenment, he advocated taking children from their parents, raising them with people that didn't love them, to make them be able to be molded, you know, for the profit of the elite. So, so it's always been important to people with an agenda of control to get the children, to get them out of the home, to break the bond or weaken the bond or, you know, dilute the bond with children. Right. I mean, this is what you said right now. You mentioned all those systems, these totalitarian systems. Nazism, communism and stuff. Right now in Europe we've got something like a political correctness. It's another incarnation. I'd say it's a, com it's a Marxism according to Gramsci. I mean what struck me here in, in the Constitution, I've got the passage here which says like provision shall be made by law that in the resolution of all proceedings brought by the state as guardian of the common good for the purpose of preventing the safety and welfare of any child being preji prejudicially? prejudicially prejudicially affected. This word I highlighted in red, prejudicially, right? What does it mean? Like, who is going to, to check if the attitude is prejudice or not? Yeah, well, that right? was very interesting because it, it also, you're, you're, there's a, a word in there you're also missing, is likely to yeah. be. Likely, to, likely be. to be. So you have several words there. Number one, someone has to make a judgment, and that's the state through mm -hmm. one of these social workers or judges or whatever. 
has to make a judgment what is going to happen in the future or what could happen Crystal in the future. Crystal ball. Crystal ball. So likely um, to be prejudicially, and again, prejudicially, this is the idea. It's got the judicial aspect of it, of making a judgment. Um, this is the whole thing about what we think on balance, our opinion, our own agenda, you know, the state's agenda. You know, if, if your agenda was that everyone woke up or everyone grew up with good self-discipline, independent spirit, you know, a deep faith, etc., then you would see very differently than if you were a state that, you know, wanted someone who is malleable, controllable, totally obedient to the state, and unconnected to any other ethos that would dilute their loyalty to the state. Well, you would think prejudicially meant something different. And then even the word affected, it's not effected, it's not EFF, -F, it's AFF. -F. Effected means something's happened. Right. Something's been done, mm -hmm. something is. Affected is about influence, attitude, influence. It's again just completely the stuff of uh, opinion. But the critical thing is the state gets to have the opinion, not the parent. That's it's the state who decides. That's really scary, what you're it's, saying. Well, you know, during the campaign, the other side really didn't have answers. They had their, man, you know, their formulas, they repeated them over and over like the chorus to a song. Mantras, yeah. But when we would talk and we would say what's actually in it, they would then say we were scaremongering. And my feeling about that is there's a lot to be scared of in this. There's a lot for parents and children to be terrified of in this. Now, of course, as, as a person of faith, you know, I don't get terrified. Mm -hmm. you know, well, I, I, I have to trust, but... There are seriously dangerous things here. I think they are actually, because like uh, lately on September, in September, we had two cases in Poland that very fresh. Like uh, one case, there was a woman who was owing to the state, to, to the fiscal, uh, 500 euros. She actually was assaulted by policemen during the night, at 10 o'clock in the evening. The kids were sleeping. Uh, she was taken uh, to, the, to the prison. And the kids were taken to the orphan house. That's one case. That's one case. The other case is two kids. I mean, the woman, as, as very similar to the case you told us about, w woman went to the like you know social social care for the help. The help, the only help which, which they gave her was take away her two babies. And and that's not the end. Two of these babies were, I mean, given to the foster parents, and those parents turned out to be psychotic. And they murdered both of these kids. Within like, there was a time span. One kid was disappeared. There were some time, some time passed, and the other also ki was killed. So I think there is something to be scared. Well, it's there is. Stuff. There is. And you know, in that case I told you about, she did get her child back at the age of two because he was so badly damaged from neglect in foster care. She would never have gotten her child back otherwise. I mean, there are some very good foster parents. But these were not, and she got her, she. That was why she got her child back. He still couldn't talk. He still couldn't feed himself. He, you know, do any of the things he should have done it too. Kathy, how many people? I mean, we had this already. We had already this referendum. Uh, what was the outcome? It was like seventy seven percent people didn't go. Uh, um, yes, the outcome. It was very interesting because the first poll mm -hmm. had. I think it was 72% yes, you know, going for this, because people didn't know what it was. They thought if you love children, you have to vote yes. And 4% no, of people who knew the issues, obviously. Were but how many people went who actually well, were uh, Yes, entitled. but that was, that was three weeks before the, mm -hmm. before the vote. Then we know that three or four days before the vote, mm -hmm. we have a little bit of a test, because people who voted by post and we have four documented uh, tallies on postal votes. And we see that the postal votes that were done before the Supreme Court judgment saying the state was cheating and lying um, show that there was 
almost an 80, over 80% 80 in all four cases, yes, vote. Now, on the Thursday before the Saturday vote, the Supreme Court came out and unanimously found that the state had broken the rules, that they had pretended to give people information, which was a booklet into every home, a website, advertisements, but that it was really yes propaganda. Okay, so which, what, they, what are you which is against the law. Let, let's cl clarify yeah. this. So what you are saying right now, because we have to, to tell our listeners that that was you or the, the alliance, right? Actually sued the whole. Well, we 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 asked somebody to take the case. I I would have. It wasn't the alliance. I would have done a lot of organizing mm -hmm, in the case, mm -hmm. but um, a, a man called Mark McChrystal stepped up to the plate and took the case. Took the case against the state. Against the state for. Against the referendum. No, he he took the case that the state were using taxpayers' money mm -hmm. to push for a yes result, and that's illegal. Right. And he got a unanimous Supreme Court decision. When? On the Thursday. And but the... critically, the vote was on Saturday, mm -hmm. and there's a moratorium in the media on Friday, on, on the day before a vote. So 24 hours before there was a media blackout, he got a decision that they not only had pushed for a yes, but they had also misstated the effect of the referendum. So they had cheated and lied. Now, because of that, there was a huge surge to the no. But we maintain there was also a huge stepping back from voting at all. And um, so we can see that postal votes that were cast before that judgment, before the Supreme Court, were 80% and more for the referendum, uh, yes votes. But at the actual poll, after the judgment, we saw the national average was 53%. So big drop. Mm -hmm. And all that happened in between was the Supreme Court. Yeah, but what I would like to ask you right now, why it happened if the Supreme Court ruled, up, ruled that it was unlawful, right? That the government cheated and lied. Why actually it happened at all? It shouldn't have. Yeah. You know, like a referee in a soccer match. It's unlawful, It right? should have, yes. It, the Supreme Court backed away from stopping the referendum. I think that was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. I think they should have either called it off mm -hmm. or they should have put the date forward by a week or two to give a chance for, um, you know... Because what, what can we see right now is that the Irish government is breaking the law in, in daylight, in open daylight, yeah. and, and nobody really does anything about this. Yeah, and there are no consequences. Yes, and the yes. fact is that from 1937 when we got this constitution to 1987, for 50 years the state obeyed the rules and the referendums were hard fought and um, but since 1987 virtually every referendum the state has interfered. And okay, there have been are those three people? or four. What party? What party? Oh, are no, it's right not now? the parties. Political parties mm -hmm. and individual politicians can campaign how they want. Mm -hmm. But it's when you take taxpayers' money and a government department or the government itself spends money promoting one side of a referendum. And we had, because of that, we've had several court challenges. It's absolutely been spent, spelt out in what's called the McKenna judgment, the Coughlin judgment. Um, that there can't be this sort of unfairness in the media and in government. Yet they just keep breaking the rules. And this is what's critical about the challenge that we're taking now, is that we're showing that they're going to keep breaking the rules for the simple fact that there are no consequences. If they want a referendum result badly enough, then they just break the rules and yes, so the court slaps their, you know, gives them a slap on the wrist. It doesn't matter to them because they got what they wanted, which mm -hmm. was the result they wanted. And that we were going to make the case that this is really the end of democracy. I mean, referendums become a joke. And the fact is, in Ireland, we have a lot of referendums coming. Abortion, same-sex marriage, um, taking God out of the Constitution, you know, changes in the way we vote. 
we have a very free way of voting in Ireland, but they want to change it to a list system which will, you know, separate you to some extent from your representatives and make them less controllable. But if they managed right now, if they managed to to push this so blatantly, right? Now you are going, you are saying that there are going to be another referendums. They can do whatever they want. That's right, unless we win this challenge. So could you say something yeah. about this challenge? Well, the, what we're doing is, see, we've complained about it before, mm -hmm. and nothing happens. They, we've gone to court before, and it's alliance, yeah. right, or just no, no, just in different referendums, mm -hmm. and we have gotten very good judgments but no teeth to the judgments, no enforcement, no penalties. Mm -hmm. So now this time, because we have a Supreme Court decision before the judgment, or before yes. the referendum, right. absolutely confirming what we're saying, we see this as the best opportunity, and maybe the last opportunity, to get consequences. What you know? kind of consequences? Well, could, I mean, ideally, we would love to have, first and foremost, we would love to have the main consequence be rerunning this referendum. That would be What about wonderful. putting somebody into prison? Well, that would be wonderful. If we can't get the rerunning of the referendum, we at least want something strong. For instance, the minister to have to pay it back without taxpayers' money. That would bother any politician. Um, prison, absolutely. You know, we have to, maybe the overthrow of the government. Maybe, maybe the you know, they would have to step down. Whatever, we either stop pretending that we have a democratic system of referendum, or we protect our system. And that's really what our challenge is going to seek to do, you know. So, it, hopefully it will be lodged today, and um, hopefully it will be successful, and I just would love people to pray for that. So it's going to be lodged today, and when are we going to, do, to, to know if it's, well, it's successful it, or not? Well, once it's lodged, the referendum stops, in, in that the president can't sign the change to the Constitution. So there's no change to the Constitution, it's suspended. Mm -hmm. um, it probably would be in a month or two. Uh, there will be some delay because the Supreme Court gave uh, an emergency judgment, but they said they were going to give their full judgment later, so we expect that in about a month's time. And that will be important for this case. But the moment the referendum result is suspended from being put into the Yeah, the minute that the, a petition is lodged, mm -hmm. then the referendum result is suspended. And um, Now, because a petition is lodged, it has to be accepted. In other words, the courts, number one, have to feel that it's not frivolous, mm -hmm. that it's substantial enough. But I, I think that's something we're not going to have a problem with because of the Supreme Court judgment. Right. Kathy, and the last kind of question. Uh, who are we? Because you are saying we. What kind of political or social power you represent this alliance for the... For the, for the Alliance of the Parents Against the State. Because well, I, what I'm trying to, to ask, to get you, what kind of information I'm trying to get from you, is that I can see different parties here, but all of them are, were acting kind of anonymously, unanimously, you know? Yeah. But here I can see like some grassroots movement from the Irish yeah. citizens. Yeah, no, this is completely grassroots. And, and I'm not doing the work on this challenge from the Alliance of Parents and Children. Mm -hmm. I'm just doing it as a citizen, from me. You know, politically, even as an MEP, I was always a completely independent. Um, and so that I could work with whoever, on whatever, and I could do what was right. And always seek the truth and never have to compromise. So in this, I'm working just as me, at my own expense. Um, and But I'm working with hundreds of people now. I mean, I put out uh, a call, you know, just on email. I put out a call for people to, um, you know, download comments and articles and things from during the referendum. Well, people all over the country, it spread and have jumped, you know, I'm getting things all the time. I put out a call then uh, for people to pledge funds for this case uh, because there's a registration fee, we're going to need to get experts, even though the legal teams will do their work 
no win, no fee. But there are other expenses if we're going to mount a good case. And literally, I've had more than 100 pledges. So this is a small country. And every day more are coming in as people spread the word. So we're talking about a very big grassroots movement uh, for this. And I, you know, it doesn't have a name. It's not organized. But... Um, people realize we're coming to the end of our democracy if we don't do something. And, you know, having sovereignty among the people, you know, having the people be sovereign is very important to them, particularly in their own homes and in their families, because that goes to the heart. I mean, in a way, this was one of the most important referendums we've ever had, because this was about children. It was about the heart of families. It, it also involved abortion because, without explaining it, one of the rights in the UN Convention is the right to, for a child to have family planning without their parents' permission or consent or even knowledge. Yeah, I mean, what I realized that after, just a few days about, uh, after their um, referendum, straight away in, for example, for example, Classic FM, Classic His FM, they started debating about abortion, about uh, gay marriages. So I think that all this of all this kind of you know assault on the family, on 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 basic human rights, actually is is just getting getting bigger. Actually, it oh, it's getting bigger. But the thing is, all of these are battles in the same war. Yeah. You know, they're all battles in the same war for truth. Um, you know, and it's. And it's the original war, you know, Satan and yeah. the evil spirits against yeah, yeah. God and, and you know, um, and it's the same war. It just takes many different forms throughout the years. It's just become very intense. Um, but it's very important, right? Because the way I look at it, if I can just give you an analogy, is... At the beginning of this referendum, people weren't even going to bother fighting it because they, it was just so overwhelmingly yes. And some of us just realized, no, even if you don't have a hope, you have to stand up for what's true. I mean, this is about family, it's about children, it's about the truth. And I, you know, when we were realizing, look, Napoleon was an unbeatable force. And he wanted Russia, you know, and you think about, you think about, everybody thinks, you know, Nelson and Waterloo defeated Napoleon. No, it was a Russian general defeated Napoleon, when you think about it. Somebody say Winter. Well, yes, but what, what did he do? When Napoleon was on his way to Russia, he had it all planned to be back before winter and back in Paris before winter. Nice plan, huge army, unbeatable. The general studied George Washington in America. And George Washington was in this position. He had no trained soldiers, virtually no trained soldiers. He didn't have weapons. They didn't even have proper clothing. And the British had just incredible, you know, they were trained, they had everything. And he knew that the only thing they could do was keep them engaged and let this American winter do its work. So he just kept... He didn't shy from any battle, even though he knew they couldn't win it. He engaged in every battle, but he made sure it cost the British and cost them as little as possible. And then the, he made sure that they survived the winter. They drew the British into the winter. And that's how they won America. That's how they won the Revolutionary War. So the Russian general was a student of, of George Washington. He read everything George Washington had written. He read all about George Washington. So when his time came, he realized rather than go to the frontiers of Russia, you know, throw yourself into a heroic but useless battle, to just engage Napoleon at every opportunity. Make, him, make it costly and draw him deeper and deeper into Russia and let the winter defeat him. And then by the time he went back, he was so, he was no longer the invincible army and he was finished off in Waterloo. But this is what we have to do in Ireland. I just thought, you know, we have to engage every battle because it's the right thing to do. But we have to make it cost them. Which is another reason, you know, a 42% cost them a lot. Uh, if we had been a 4%, no. 
they would have strengthened. A 42% no has made people angry at them. This challenge, again, is going to highlight that they cheat, that you can't believe them, etc. It's going to cost them. The budget would draw them into the winter because the Irish winter is the recession. Yes. That's it's the, the budget. Yeah. So we draw them into our winter. So now it's going to be abortion. Well, by doing the challenge, we're going to hold off the abortion thing a little bit. You know, they ran into that because they had just won. But no, you haven't won. You've got to kind of come, come back. We've got to deal with this now. Make it cost them. Make it cost them. Make the every battle cost them. We may win the battles. Or sorry, we may lose the battles. But if we win the war, then we can regain what we lost. Now, I don't want to lose any battles, but we have to engage them. We have to make it cost them. If possible, we have to win them. But we can't shy from them. Kathy, what can I say? It was very inspiring. I wish you all the best, all the luck for Ireland, for Poland, for Europe, for our civilization, because that's the war we are waging. Yes, because this battle is in Ireland, it's in Poland, it's everywhere. And you know, we need to pray, because yeah. at the bottom, this is about good and evil. Right, right. Once again, good luck on you, God bless, and thank you for this interview. Dla niepodobnego radia PL w skorku mówiła Kathy Sinot, nasz wojownik i frontman naszej cywilizacji. Dziękuję uprzejmie. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Take care. God bless.